Hello everyone, reporting today for Fun Robotics Network, I'm Abhas, and with me here is Team 16010, Astra Machina from Omaha, Nebraska. They have been absolutely amazing this early decode season, currently ranked 10th in the world by non-penalty OPR, 2nd by auto OPR, and top 20 in teleop. This is largely in part uh, to their very, very robust shooter, super wide and fast intake, and also some really clever driver controls that I can't wait to jump into on this Behind the Bot. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Take on the decode season with Studica Robotics, featuring their FTC starter bot, new six millimeter hex shaft and motor options and updated bevel gears. FTC teams can receive a 25% discount and apply for grants at studica.com slash robots. Discover how your team can save time and money with FRC Tees. FRC Tees delivers custom team apparel with screen print, embroidery, DTF, and more options available. Join the over 200 teams and organizations who trust FRC Tees when you visit FRCTees.com today for your free quote and to apply for a team sponsorship. All right, guys, so first question is with the intake. Uh, you know, you guys have done a lot of great robot in three days, you know, early one month robots, all these different builds, and now you have the design here. Uh, walk me through why you went with these gecko wheels first. Oh uh, yeah, so originally in the season for a robot in three days in our early V1, we used boot wheels to try to kick the artifacts up into the robot. But as, as the season progressed, we noticed that the boot wheels kind of had a hard time holding the artifacts in place once inside the intake. So once we switched to the gecko wheels, that helped us like secure the third artifact in place once we intake it, not allowing it to fall out as we drove around. Mm -hmm. Got it. And could we see uh, could we see an intaking cycle, uh, you know, before we jump into more of the details um, with, with how that intake is working? Yeah. Awesome. So I noticed that your guys' uh, artifacts just come in like super, super smoothly. What compression are you running uh, on those wheels to make them do that and how fast are they spinning? Oh yeah, for our Gecko wheels, we run around 10 millimeters of compression and we run them on a 435 RPM motor at a 24 to 16 ratio. So roughly 600 to 700 RPM. Awesome. Now jumping a little bit into the transfer, I see that you have at least one uh, level of your transfer, one axle on your transfer connected to that intake. Is your entire transfer synced uh, directly to your intake or is it separate? Oh uh, yeah, our transfer, basically the way it works is that we have a ramp for, that goes directly from our intake into like a platform that has a hole in the bottom to have a kicker kick up the artifact inside the robot. The kicker is actuated by an axon mini right here. Mm -hmm. So here. Okay. Okay. I see. So as far as motors are concerned, it's a one motor intake, no extra motors for the transfer. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. And as far as um, like making sure the artifacts don't go up early, have you had to have a roof on the, on the, uh, tra on the turret plate or anything like that? Or has that really not been necessary? Oh uh, yeah. The turret plate itself acts as a roof for our artifacts to make sure it doesn't pop up or like go in the direction. We also okay. added some like Grippy tape, I believe, in order to make sure the artifact can't leave its position once it's in the transfer zone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as far as different kicker designs, uh, you know, how has this profile changed throughout the season and what were like some of the biggest improvements you made to it? Yeah, roughly, I think we had around two kicker designs throughout the season. The first one is made out of wood and is more flimsy and all. It had like more of a sharp angle. I realized that that occasionally got jammed, so we quickly made a second version that was more of like an L shape at 45 degrees that helped like with the artifact and keep it in place while we picked it up so that helped us make the transfer more consistent throughout the uh, okay push. and and i see you guys have this like yellow wall in the back uh, of your of your robot is there something specific with that geometry or that material what's going on there oh yeah that this is some foam we found in our lab that we use to make sure like, the artifact doesn't climb up and accidentally shoot out once it's intaked into the uh robot because at our first meet we had a few misfires happen so once we added this foam it helped prevent any balls from climbing up any further once we have all three intakes. I see. Okay, and then while while you had that shot down there, I saw you also had at least one, maybe two color sensors. How are you using those? Oh yeah, basically, at first we had one color sensor to detect when our artifact is inside our transfer. But at our meets, we found out that if the artif or if the color sensor sees through one of the holes, it doesn't detect it and maybe it's like a jamming or it doesn't detect anything during auto. So we added a secondary color sensor just in case the first one's covered up by a hole, the second one will see through as well. So it should be good. I see. 
I see. Now, uh, you know, last thing before we jump into the shooter, I want to talk a little bit about uh, transfer speeds. With this single servo kicker, uh, you know, what is your transfer speed and is that a limiting factor in your design currently? You roughly have around, a, 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 I think, 0 0.3 second transfer time with most of it happening as, as we pause the intake to let another artifact roll into our transfer. So that's the only thing really slowing down our transfer. The Axon itself kicks very fast, so that takes roughly, I think, like one tenth of a second. Okay, I see. So so are, are you saying that when your transfer, or maybe maybe we can just see your transfer sequence, you know, that would be great if you can just collect like two artifacts and so then we can see what that looks like. Um, but are you stopping the intake between, like when you're actually kicking the artifact up, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. We stop it between each shot to make sure the artifact doesn't roll in while the art is going back down. Okay, okay, okay. okay. I see. So I can't get a good angle to show yeah, that, that that should be good. Uh, let's see, let's see what that looks like. And if we could do two at the same time, that would be great. Or like you know, one after another. Okay, got it. That's super cool. Um, now talking a little bit about the turret and the shooter as a whole your shooter is very very minimalistic i would say like i haven't quite seen a team with so few or so small parts on their shooter why go for such a minimalist design oh yeah because our first shooter when we made it earlier in the season it was like very boxy and very wide so it had a lot of weight and it's like very sluggish when turning so our goal for our next shooter to make was to make sure that we had, first had a counter roller and second make sure as light as possible so by doing that, we cut down a lot of the weight we got for our side panels by just moving them all out by using tiny plates instead to mount our wheels together in our motors. Very cool. Talking about the, the turret first, how is your turret powered? Is it servo-based or motor-based for the power on that turret? Oh, it's motor-based. If you look down here, we have a single 435 RPM motor on a 16-tooth gear on the motor and a 84-tooth gear on a Lazy Susan. That powers our intake, our powers our turret to turn in around 360 degrees. Very cool. Now, as far as the software is concerned with that, uh, do you, how do you zero your turret to make sure you know the position at all times? Are you adding any extra sensors or is it just based off the motor encoder? Yeah, it's based off the motor encoder. At the start of each match, we make sure that it's fully lined up at the zero mark. At the end of auto, we have a case in which if it runs out of time, we make it automatically go to zero, even if it's in the middle of shooting to ensure that our turret doesn't go off like, mm -hmm. while uh, until the update. Awesome. And and why go for that motor based shooter or motor based turret? Did you did you know that you needed the speed or did you just have the motor as an extra motor? Oh yeah, when we were first prototyping, we usually thought to use a motor because of the speed and torque that we thought the turret was gonna need for the shooter. And the fact that our old shooter is very heavy, it kind of required us to use a motor versus a, a servo based turret for the most part. Okay, got it. Alright, let's let's jump into the shooter here. So I see you guys have two uh, you know, wheels. Now you have that front uh, roller and then that rear counter roller as well. Let's start with the speeds. How fast are each of these spinning? Yeah, this first one is on a one-to-one -one ratio on a 6,000 RPM motor. And this has a 96 millimeter Rhino wheel in order to power the main shooter wheel. Mm -hmm. And then the counter roller? Yeah, for the counter roller, we have that at a three to one ratio. So it inputs around, I think, 18,000 RPM as an output in total with 6,000 as an input. We use two gears to power that, and then a 122th gear to power the last set. Oh, wow. Okay, so uh, as far as that RPM on the on the top, that 18,000 RPM, was that uh, just because of like how the wheel diameters worked out, or are you intentionally making that one spin faster? Why go such a high RPM? Oh yeah, the RPM we needed to make sure this counter roll was around 12,000. We want to also make sure that we could adjust the angle by increasing or decreasing the speed. So by choosing like having a high RPM as the max, we could adjust the angle of the ball, whether we're shooting from close or far, which you'll implement soon in our next move. Okay, very cool. Now, now talking about the shooter and adding that counter roller, you know, you guys have built uh, at least one or two robots before that didn't have the counter roller. What difference did you see uh, was made by adding that counter roller? We added the counter roller because a lot of the time when during our matches, the ball would either bounce out or it would just like bounce around for too long. And so we added the counter roller so that when we shot it and it went to the goal, it didn't bounce around and it went almost straight to the uh, exit point. Yeah, the ramp. 
Yeah. Sorry. Okay. And, we and so, so it's saying one in five, I'd say, to almost all of them they like, going in. Okay. Oh, wow. Very cool. And as far as uh, like close and far launch, then you guys touched on this a little bit before, but are, are you saying that you can completely launch like from either zone anywhere on the field just by adjusting the yeah. speeds or do you think you still need a hood? Yeah, for the most part, we're still tuning this new counter roller as we just like, built it, I think a few days ago, right for me. But we could shoot from almost any part of the field, including like, places outside the launch zone, just by using our map, using a simple linear regression line and some trigonometry for the turret. Very cool. Now, talking a little bit about um, uh, the the spin up time, right, and the time between shots. A lot of teams we've seen have added like counterweights or like flywheel weights, going even up to like three, four pounds. You guys have absolutely no weight on your shooter, as far as I can tell. So, what has that done for your shooting time, and why have you not added any weight? Oh well, yeah. So on our original shooter, we actually did have a steel flywheel at first, but making this new version, since we went from having two motors powering the flywheel to just one. We tested out just having one single rhino wheel with nothing else. And so far, since our kicker takes a second to launch another ball up, we realized that the recovery time between shots was quick enough so that we could still use a very light wheel, which also helped increase our spin time very fast in auto, which helped cut us down around a second, I believe. Awesome. Yeah, talking about software now, first with auto, you guys have the second highest auto OPR in the world. Huge congratulations on that. You know, that's not easy at all. What do you think are like the biggest uh, testing practices or software practices that you guys have that really make sure you have a consistent auto? Yeah, I think for the most part, for making sure your auto is consistent, the first thing you do is make sure you take autos one step at a time. Don't go for like some crazy, like 18 artifact auto straight off the bat. Like start off some of like a six artifact, then move to a nine, then move to a 12. To make sure once you have each step consistent, then you move on to the next step to make sure that you aren't like missing steps along the way. Perfect, yeah. Talking about teleop. So you guys told me that you have four buttons only for the driver, which was pretty shocking to me. Walk me through that. Oh yeah, so for our driver one, all we have is the two joysticks in order to actually control the drivetrain movement, this normal turn and going back and forth at robot centric. And then for driver two. Driver two, all we really have is an intake button to turn on the intake and stop the intake. So when the match or auto ends, we turn on the intake and then we stop the intake once there's three balls in, just so we prevent any push-ups. Um, even though it doesn't happen that often, it's a good safety. And then we also have a outtake just in case something gets stuck and we have the transfer button. Awesome. Yeah, so, so talking through that shooting process, uh, like what is the automation looking like? How do you make sure that you, you move on after you shoot the three balls? What are what advice do you have for rookie teams out there? So what we do is our driver one, their purpose is to get the balls and get like to where the balls are while our driver two is to control the intakes that when we do get to the clump of balls or balls we're able to just seamlessly and effortlessly grab them so our driver one can then get in position and line us up so that driver two can shoot the balls without much time wasted and communicating um like shoot now grab the balls here and all that mm -hmm. and do you guys leave your shooter running throughout the match or do you start and stop it between shots we leave it running the whole match Okay, okay, and you haven't noticed any like significant uh, degradation in your batteries or slowing down throughout the match or anything like that? Um, the matches aren't long enough for it to truly affect us. If we, but, run, if we run like longer practice matches though, <clears throat> our batteries definitely drain pretty fast, yeah. yeah. Okay. They drain. Okay. Cool. Now, la last question is about the turret. You know, you have your turret aiming super, super accurately throughout the entire match. You, you said that's purely just based off of like geometry and the pinpoints and that, that I understand. Uh, as far as drift is concerned, has that been something you faced with this turret? Oh yeah, for our turret, for the most part, our drift is very small because the pinpoint does a very good job at making sure like the drift isn't accumulating too much throughout the match. But just in case our drift becomes too much, we do have a rehoming button on driver one that's used just in case we get like shoved, for example, or one of our auto pods goes out. So once we go to the center of the field, roughly, we press the rehoming button. That rehomes the turret to make sure it's facing the full again. Awesome. Yeah, Astra Machina, thank you guys so much. You know, you guys have just been the perfect example of a very, very strong early season team. And I know you're going to continue this uh, to the rest of the decode season. So I can't wait to see how this bot shakes out and how the rest of your competitions go.
Thank you very much. Reporting for Fun Robotics Network, I'm Am Haas, and this is Team 16010, Astro Machina. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to stay up to date on future fun videos. Discover how your team can save time and money with FRC Tees. FRC Tees delivers custom team apparel with screen print, embroidery, DTF, and more options available. Join the over 200 teams and organizations who trust FRC Tees when you visit FRCTees.com today for your free quote and to apply for a team sponsorship. Take on the decode season with Studica Robotics, featuring their FTC starter bot, new 6mm hex shaft and motor options, and updated bevel gears. FTC teams can receive a 25% discount and apply for grants at studica.com robots. So